of all, in introduction, I want to mention this to you that um, there are many Christians today that are unaware of the role of Israel. Um, and the media obviously doesn't make it any easier. Uh, unfortunately, from what I can see, uh, from the global media, quite often what we see and hear is often uh, biased or politically tinted so that we don't get full understanding. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not uh, sitting down here today trying to tell you about we should cite Israel or we should cite uh, Palestine and you'll come to understand. It's not about whose side do we take, it's about understanding what's going on in the spiritual realm so that you will have a better insight to the conflicts that is taking place today. Unfortunately, um, even in the theological circles, Christian circles, something called replacement theology. Uh, you'll be wondering what on earth is that. Replacement theology means, ah, oh, you know, uh, Israel has been replaced by the church, so they are insignificant anymore. We are more important than them. Things like that and uh, anti-Semitic feelings. There's a lot of people who, who develop what we call an anti-Semitic uh, notion. Such um, feelings, and they have not helped, except, um, and they are also quite strong among some, uh, as far as I know, Christian denominations. Uh, therefore, we need to be able to look and say what is really going on here. And of course, the world, uh, the way it's divided today is that you are either in the camp of those, of those who want to bless Israel, or you are in the camp of those who want to blast <laughs> Israel. Uh, some of the political uh, parties uh, actually want to completely eliminate this nation, if possible. They say that we would like to have them completely destroyed. Again, is that a uh, plan of God? The funny thing is that to the Jew, if you are a Jew, uh, this is a very, very familiar feeling since conception of the nation. Uh, it has been uh, fulfilling in a sense God's prophecy. Uh, twice almost they were completely eradicated as a nation and they have been sent out of their land. So it's not an unfamiliar feeling for uh, the Jewish uh, people. But what I want to explain to you today is, what is the role of Israel? What is it? At the same time, why is Jerusalem such a sore point in history? Because it looks like every time we try to resolve this Middle East conflict, it somehow boils down to Jerusalem. Why is it such a sore point? How should the church you know, react to it? Not just to, to Israel as a political nation or a geographical site, but how should the church understand, especially the spiritual implications of God's um, promise to the nation of Israel and to the larger world, uh, so to speak. And these are some of the questions I would like to take today. Very briefly, I hope I will be able to manage the given time. The kids will be done in 12, right? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Also, I'll try. <laughs> anyway, I'll try to keep uh, within the, the, the time limit. And if I pass the time limit, I will... I will keep an ear that once the kids are done, I will, I will sort it out. But first of all, I want to tell you that there's some, something called, uh, in the Bible, you've got to understand that before God begins to, to pronounce His judgment to either a person, an individual, a nation, a group, there are what we call the four stages of judgment. And, and if, if you don't understand that, you, you completely forget as to how God is dealing with us. And these four stages of judgment actually is found in the book of um, uh, Romans. And if you don't have the scriptures, just listen to me. I'm going to quote from Romans chapter 1, verse 18, all the way down to verse um, 32. Very important scriptures. And this will give you the framework and understanding of how is God dealing with you and me uh, today. First of all, let's look at uh, Romans uh, chapter 1 verses 18 onwards. This is what the Bible says. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people, listen very carefully, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, 
being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. All people. I go to verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for, for a lie. And worship and serve created things rather than the Creator, who is forever to be praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave over, gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The same way the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they, although they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. Very strong, heavy passage in the Bible. Um, Romans, uh, written by Paul the Apostle, and he begins to draw the case as to why did God pour out His wrath. It's not because God is sitting around waiting to punish people. That's not the kind of God we serve. Um, it's because He has given loads and loads of opportunities to us to respond. And He has got four stages. You see, God will make himself known. I just want you to know this. God will make himself known to any person, nation or culture who seeks him. Because that's what the Bible says in Jeremiah. If you seek me, you will find me. The Lord says. Uh, like I told you myself, you know, uh, my wife included, many of us uh, in Singapore were not necessarily born and raised Christians. We were having a hungry heart and God came to us. He made himself known to us. So God will do that to anybody, anywhere. It doesn't matter which planet you are in. Well, hopefully planet Earth. <laughs> which part of the planet you are in. Which nation you are in. Which jungle you are in. He will make Himself known to you if you seek Him. If you seek Him, you will find Him. That is basically the promise of God. So, He will move, believe me, He will move heaven and earth if He has to, in order to come to you and reveal to you His uh, righteousness and explain to you about unrighteousness. But however, if, if we constantly suppress uh, the, the presence of God and the understanding of God away from us and, and away from our conscious understanding, there are four stages before God begins to judge. And these same principles apply to Israel as well, just that you understand. The first stage of judgment that comes to a person, a nation or a culture that suppresses righteousness by unrighteousness is what we call idolatry, as we just read. Idolatry, when you, when, you, when, you, when you have righteousness, but you suppress righteousness with unrighteousness, the first judgment that comes to you is idolatry. You turn away from the spiritual God and you turn into idols of whatever kind. 
or nature. That's the first sign of judgment. This is to a person or a nation. The second stage of judgment comes to a person or a nation or a culture that suppresses righteousness by unrighteousness. From idolatry, you move into what we call materialism. Materialism is where things become more important, created things, than the creator himself. The first stage is to exchange the creator for an image. The second stage is you go into materialism, where you think that everything in this world is uh, the, 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 the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life is more important than, than, than stuff. Then you move into the third stage of judgment. The third stage of judgment that comes to a person, a nation, or a culture that suppresses righteousness but by unrighteous, unrighteousness is uh, sexual immorality. So you see the degradation. Idolatry, materialism, sexual immorality. Sexual immorality of every degree that you can think of. That's the third stage. The fourth and the last stage in which a nation or a culture that suppresses righteousness by unrighteousness. This is what happens. They go into what the Bible calls destruction. The Bible calls it, uh, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Uh, and the Greek, you know, uh, here speaks very accurately of the, of the judgment that comes when you have a depraved mind or destruction. So what are the four stages? Idolatry, materialism, sexual immorality, destruction is a stage. This comes to anybody, any person, any nation, any culture that begins to um, give up uh, serving God and decides that I'm, I'm all with it. So this is the same thing that happens to, to Israel itself. And just to understand what is going on in Israel today and why it happens, let me just give you some background. First of all, we need to understand that it was during a time like this on the planet when more or less the entire uh, civilization was turning away from God, we have a guy who enters into the scene called Abraham. So, it was in such a time in the world that it, uh, God called Abraham, he was an Assyrian from Assyria, uh, that area called Mesopotamia or Babylonia, where is Iraq is today, Iraq, Iran, that region. So, Abraham enters into a world and he, th th during that time, the world was more or less pushing the knowledge of God uh, out of their conscious mind, trying to say, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So Abraham comes because his father, you've got to understand that Abraham uh, worked for his father. That's how it was, the trade was passed from father to son. And his father was an idolater. Abraham's you know, father made all kinds of idols. In other words, if you need a God, you just went to Abraham's uh, 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 father, which is Terah, and you asked for it. So he would tailor make a God just for you. So Abraham grew up in a culture where he understood everything about gods. You, you want to know about God, you go to Terah. Terah will make you one. What do you want? Tell me what kind of God you want. I make special price for you, my friend. So the Middle East, that's the way it was. So basically, whatever. You want wood, gold, silver, whatever. He will take for you. So Abraham grew up seeing with his own eyes these things. And he knew about God. So but he was in such a state, the Bible says that he must have had a lot of questions and, and thought and somehow he was searching, reaching out in a generation, in a time, it was almost like Noah's time, where everybody was pushing away the thought of God. And Abraham was reaching out and the real God, our living almighty God, reaches out and speaks to him. And then he realizes, this is different, this is the real deal. This is not one of those that my father was making, that I grew up seeing. That's, when, that's why it's awesome to have Abraham uh, coming into the scenario right now because he had a, he had a doctor of philosophy in, in, um, uh, when it comes to uh, theology, when it comes to divinity. He had a doctor of divinity, so to speak, if you understand what I'm saying. So therefore, he was the kind of guy that God reached out to. Now, does God pick one man to form one nation through which the knowledge of God can be somehow preserved because the knowledge of God is being eliminated. Abraham chose to follow God and then he crosses the river, uh, the Mesopotamian river, and that's why we call him today the Jew because uh, the Jew simply means that he crossed the river. And that's where the, the, the name Jew, Jewish came from because of crossing the river and going to uh, the region of Palestine, uh, uh, the entire region of Palestine. In fact, there was no such people called Palestinians, I'll explain to you later why. 
that whole region uh, was called Palestine because it go there and I'm going to reveal yourself. There are four reasons why Israel is chosen. Let me explain to you this as well. If you wonder why, why Israel? Why not anybody? First and foremost, at that period in time, nobody responded, Abraham did. And there are four main reasons why God picked this guy. Why was Israel chosen? Number one, God showed his reality by how he blessed Israel in obedience and disciplined them in disobedience. God says, I am a real God. This is a relationship. The entire Torah, uh, as well as the New Testament, as we understand it, the whole Bible as you and I know it, is a, a, a story of a relationship between Almighty God and a people. It's about an encounter. Like I told you many times, it's a relationship. It's nothing to do with the religion. Are you following me? So, God picked this one and He says that, I want to show you to this one nation that you obey me, of course you'll be blessed because that's my plan. You disobey me, it's not my plan, there will be consequences. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they were called to re reveal the Word of God in the written form for the very first time. Until then, the Word of God was never written down. It was always passed on, the knowledge of God, the information of God passed on from Word of God. But the nation was picked because now God wants His Word written. That's why when God came to Moses, it was the Ten Commandments, almost handwritten. Uh, handwritten by the finger of God himself. For the first time, it's like, now I have a nation, show you blessings first. Secondly, I want you to preserve my word in a written form. Thirdly, they were called to not only preserve uh, the word of God for the first time, but also to, re uh, to, to, to promote the word of God. Not just to preserve it, but also to promote it. Fourth, but not the, the last uh, reason, they were called to be the physical race through which the Messiah uh, was going to be revealed to this world, the Savior. And we thank God that uh, it's through them that God said uh, to Abraham, I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through you, the nations are going to be blessed. That's because the Messiah will eventually come. Uh, that's uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? So, very important. Now, you've got to understand that if, because of this, Satan wants to destroy the custodian of God's word. That's what he wants to do. The devil says, no, no, no. This word cannot be preserved. It should not be. So, but God made a covenant with Abraham to give him a nation whose boundaries were specifically specified by God. God says, Abraham, you will be the custodian. I'm making a covenant with you. I specify the boundary. God making a covenant with man. Specific boundaries. Now, God disciplined and judged every nation that mistreated them even though he predicted that he would scatter them throughout the earth. Every time a nation came and bullied them, they were judged very heavily. Even while God said, even though I've been merciful to you, I've helped you, I've blessed you, but you are still going to disobey me, and in fact I'm going to scatter you. It was prophesied that they will be scattered. Because it's the same judgment that God uses them to carry out on the people around them, that also comes upon them. Are you following? It's very important to understand. So obviously, um, uh, God disciplined them and judged them and, and also judged every nation that mistreated them and as a result of that, they were scattered throughout the earth not once, but twice, maybe even, we can say three times uh, even during the time of, as recent as the Holocaust period until they came back. Today, what happens is that the media uses such terms such as saying that this is a country that is uh, a nation that is built on genocide and they, they're built on, on ethnic cleansing. That's what the media often says. We must stop and remind ourselves that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And uh, even from the time of Noah, God had actually wiped out this planet once simply because of wickedness and because of the, 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 the humankind suppressing righteousness with unrighteousness. God is a righteous God and He would not let that happen where you suppress righteousness with unrighteousness. What stops him, I think, God, from wiping out this entire planet is because of the covenant he made with Noah. He told Noah, all right, I did this once, I'm not going to do it again. So therefore, that stops him. Israel was sent into the promised land um, as God's judgment to the nations that existed before them because they were there and they had passed those. And you wonder, what, why, why, God, why did you allow Israel to go into the promised land and, and, and destroy people before them. Because there were these four, four stages of judgment that I just pointed to you out. 
Once you pass those four stages, and then God says, you know, time is up. So Israel was sent in to actually carry out the judgment of God on the nations that were there before them, while they themselves were subject to those same judgments if they follow the same path. And as you can read from the Bible, that relationship was going on. Now we come to Jerusalem, which is very interesting. The current so-called peace process that we always hear about in the media, peace, peace, you know, we're going to make peace, it always stops at Jerusalem. Have you realized that? And the question you ask is, why? Jerusalem is not uh, situated by a seaport. Um, for those of you who are going to go for the Israeli the tour, you're going to love this because you will see it with your own eyes. Jerusalem is not situated by a seaport or a river. It is not a major trade route even today uh, for a caravan trail in those days. It has got no major source of natural water. In fact, one of the most driest places in the whole of Israel is in Jerusalem. There's no water uh, in Jerusalem. The water in Jerusalem is actually pumped in from, from Jordan. Uh, when you go to Jerusalem, when you are in Tel Aviv, or when you are in Jerusalem, uh, when you go to Israel in Jerusalem, there's no water. Source of water is not there. We get the water, in fact, from, from the Jordan River. It's kind of funny because whenever we make a uh, trip to Israel, we often go down to the Jordan to, to get baptized. Because, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's John water, this is where Jesus was baptized, and John the Baptist, and so on. In reality, if you're in your hotel in Jerusalem and turn on the shower, it's the same, same water. Of <laughs> course, <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell the people because they want to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, anyway, whatever, that makes you happy, you'll be fine. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't really know that. <laughs> Eddie was one person that too. <laughs> Now, um, but anyway, it's not strategically located uh, and it has got no military purpose in reality. The thing is that Jerusalem's earliest history is tied to the spiritual realm. You gotta understand that. That's why in Genesis chapter uh, 14, from verses 18 to 20, for the very first time, Jerusalem is actually brought into the scenario. Abraham had gone out and with a very small army, he had defeated uh, some big armies and as a result of that he had a lot of uh, plunder that he came back from and he was a massive victory. So when Abraham came back, uh, he met uh, the king of, um, of Salem and his name was Melchizedek. It, it says in, in Jerusalem, um, Jerusalem, it says in Genesis chapter 14, 18 to 20, it says that Melchizedek, king of Salem, very interesting, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High and blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Then Abraham gave him a tent of everything. Abraham just came back from a battle, lots of, uh, of, 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 of you know, bounties from the bread, from the uh, war. Melchizedek comes, Abraham recognizes him as king of, uh, of, of God uh, Almighty. He was the uh, uh, king of Salem. And then he begins to, at that time, uh, Jerusalem was called Salem. And so he gives him a tent of, it's funny, he pays his tent immediately to God for his victory. Isn't that interesting? The, the very act of worship. So this is the very first time the word uh, Jerusalem appears in the Bible. So King Melchizedek was actually the mysterious priest of Most High God, whom Abraham blessed and paid him a time. He was the king of Salem, also known as Salem basically means peace. Uh, Salem, uh, where we get the word Shalom, uh, in some other languages it's called uh, 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 Salem, which basically means uh, peace. Um, after this, the city was the home of a group of people known as the Jebusites. Many of these people were very, very big. The Jebusites were like eight feet tall, um, and they were like giant. In fact, uh, Joshua and, and Caleb, when they went to uh, Jerusalem at that time, they looked at the Jebusites, and they were like, these guys are giants. We are like grasshoppers. And in those days, you had these fellows who were actually pretty tall. I'm talking about tall, tall, tall. You know, um, I don't know who is the tallest guy in this church, but if you take the tallest guy, maybe it's Daniel, your son, and you make twice as the height of, of Daniel, then you understand what I mean by tall. He's a huge giant, so that's why these Israelites, Middle Eastern Jewish guys, they felt like, oh, we're like grasshoppers, because they were that huge. So anyway, the city was later on called uh, Jebus, uh, because 
uh, 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 rather it was called Jevus. And um, the, the, the Israelites who lived there, they lived under their rule of the people of Jevus. Now David finally defeated Jerusalem in 1000 BC. This is a long, long time ago. And uh, by God's command, and then he established it as the eternal capital city uh, of Israel. This is found in Psalm 24. This is going way back to 1000 BC. The city was also known as Jebus at that time. Not Jebus, but Jebus because of the Jebusite. It was also known as Salem because of the um, of, of, of Melchizedek. So then eventually it, be, it came to be known as Jeru Salem as a combination of these two uh, words. That's how today we call it Jerusalem. Jerusalem simply means uh, city of peace. And I know it can sound a little bit comical. There's anything there but peace <laughs> today. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, now David bought a, a, a land. He bought a, a piece of real estate, 35 acres. Not a very big land, but he bought it from a, a guy called Onan. Onan, he was a Jebusite. In fact, Onan said, I'll give it to you if you need it. But David very wisely bought it uh, and he wanted to have a record of it. Onan wanted to donate. He said, no, David paid the full price. This piece of real estate, of land, that was bought by David from Onan is today known as the Temple Mount. Perhaps uh, it's one of the most disputed piece of real estate on the entire planet. Very interesting. That's where the original temple that uh, was built, the first temple uh, to God, and then later on the, the temple was re uh, extended during the time of uh, the, the Romans and eventually destroyed. And this is where the Bible talks about where the third temple is going to be. But that same real estate is where today we have got the um, uh, Dome of the Rock, which is an Islamic uh, holy site. Uh, and the, the, the western wall, we call it the Wailing Wall, the remains of that old temple is still there. Those of you who go to Jerusalem for a tour in October, you will understand this here. So this piece of land is the most disputed land on the entire planet because it's tied to the spiritual world. So we'll go a little bit further to give you some understanding. Now, um, where did I stop? Oh, right here. So, David built an altar, and there uh, he offered sacrifices. Solomon built the temple, and this, uh, it was there in the same place. Without Jerusalem, there is no ultimate, Israel has no ultimate meaning, and Judaism has no ultimate meaning. Ju it, 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 is, it is Jerusalem that makes the ultimate sense to them. It is now over 3,000 years since the founding of Israel's greatest king, and the city was also known at that time, not so much today, as the city of David. Jerusalem was also known as the city of David. Now, at AD 70, this is after the Roman Empire came to power. At AD 70, the temple was not only dismantled, uh, the temple was actually burned down. And why the Romans did that was because they were, first of all, very, very upset with the rebellion that was going on in the city. Because after the death of Jesus, a lot of disciples thought that you know, uh, Jesus talked about the, the kingdom of God. A lot of them still felt the kingdom of God was when they were going to take over uh, uh, the, 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 the Roman Empire. And so, because of the intense rebellion, finally the Romans decided they were going to destroy this temple for good. And in the process of burning the temple, the, the, there was gold embedded into the building of the temple. And some of this gold melted and went into the columns and into the pillars. And so what the Romans did, they wanted the gold. So they literally had to take one stone out of another, dismantle it totally, in order to get the gold out. And that's why Jesus' prophecy that he said, look at this temple, not one stone will be left on another, was completely fulfilled, including the cornerstone was removed. Is that amazing? Awesome. This is history now and facts. Prophecy coming to pass. Now anyone who wants to build an empire, if we talk about a world empire, that encompasses both Asia, Africa and Europe, will have to conquer that span of, uh, of area in the, middle, in, the, in the Middle East. Because Israel and its capital Jerusalem has a very, very significant uh, role to play. That is why you will see in history the Assyrians, the Hittites, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, everybody had an interest there. All the major empires. Have you seen that? Because you've got to have that piece of real estate. 
But God has miraculously delivered the, the, the Jews time and time again. It's always been a miracle, um, miracle. Even after they got their independence in 1948, six days later there was a war. And they, were, they should have been wiped out. They had nothing. They had very little weapon, almost nothing. Miraculously, God was able to deliver them again. It's really amazing. The real danger though for Israel was not powers from outside. The real danger for Israel was from within. It's themselves departing from their faith. That was the real danger. And still is today. Isn't that interesting? And because of them departing from their faith almost twice, in fact I could say three times uh, in history, either by the Babylonians or the Romans or by Hitler during the time of uh, the Second World War, they were almost wiped out as a nation and came back uh, miraculously. Now I want to almost conclude by going through a very interesting part of the discussion and that's about Ishmael and uh, Isaac's friction. And this will make you understand what's going on right up to today. Alright, the judgment of God, we talked about the spiritual realm of, of uh, Jerusalem, will end with this conflict. And then I'll take some questions and answers because I hope we'll have time for them. The, Ishmael, the Ishmaelites as well as the Arabs uh, feel that um, Israelites, uh, Isaac or Israelites, they have somehow cheated them of their birthright. You see, because Ishmael, who is Abraham's son, uh, didn't get the, 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 the blessings, instead Isaac got it. And somehow the Ishmaelites always felt, and their brothers, you've got to understand, these are Arabs, they are brothers, they've always felt like, we've been cheated. We've been cheated, we've been deceived. That's carried on. So therefore, in AD 622, one of the Ishmaelite's son, which is Muhammad, uh, the founder of Islam, he started Islam. Now, the funny thing is that wherever Islam is embraced, that this passionate hatred for the Jews is inherited. What is that hatred? We have been cheated of the firstborn. We have been cheated of our birthright. Are you feeling good? Very, very important to understand that because otherwise it will not make sense why are the Arabs and the Jews, they are brothers, why are they fighting? That's because of this unsettled dispute, this feeling. Now many years after Muhammad's death, a myth was actually created, this is very important for you to understand. A myth was created that would uh, kind of bind both religions to Jerusalem. Let me explain to you what the myth was. This is kind of interesting. According to the myth, it says that Muhammad ascended to heaven on his horse from the rock where Abraham sacrificed Ishmael. Uh, it just so happens that the same area is the Temple Mount where uh, the, the, the Dome of the Rock is today. This makes Jerusalem the third holiest site for the Islamic faith next to Mecca and Medina. Because Mecca was their most holiest site, Medina, uh, that's why the mosque in Mecca was called the nearest mosque and the uh, mosque in Medina was called the furthest mosque. This became their most holy site. But according to the prophet Zechariah, the ancient conflict between Ishmael and Isaac over Jerusalem will fuel and start what we call the final war. Some people call it the third world war. I don't know if it's going to be the third, but I know that the final war uh, ending in the... Uh, Battle of Armageddon is going to take place, and this will actually fuel this conflict. Will be the major conflict, the big one, if you will. Now, um, for Muslims, to give up Jerusalem is to deny their Quran, and for the Jews, to give up Jerusalem is to deny their Quran and all their many years of exiles. So, can you see the problem here? Now, in the Quran. You'll be surprised, but you can do your own research. In the Quran, Jerusalem is not mentioned once. Not once. Isn't that interesting? In the Bible, Jerusalem is mentioned more than 600 times. Massive difference. Very important. In the Quran, if you have ever read the Quran before, there's one chapter called Surah. Surah chapter 17 and verse 1. It very vaguely mentions Al-Quds. Al-Quds or the al simply means the furthest mosque. And they believe that the Dome of the Rock, or the what they, is known today as the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is Al-Quds. But there's a big, big problem there. I'll explain to you why. Because there was a Benzamite church there when Muhammad actually died in 632 AD. You see, Jerusalem has been fought over time and time again. 
uh, you had the Ottomans, and then uh, before the, the Ottomans were the Benzemites, and, and uh, you had the Crusaders, which is one of the most embarrassing, embarrassing time of uh, Christian history. Um, in any case, during the time when Muhammad died, there was, uh, the Benzemites were then in charge, and they had a, a church, and the church was called the Church of St. Mary Augustine. So, if according to what uh, the myth was, that he ascended from the Dome of the Rock, when there was a church there at that time, the question arises, did Muhammad then rise from a Christian church and from a Christian altar during the time of his death? That's very interesting to be aware. Now, during the diaspora, that's when, you know, uh, when the Jews were all over the world, the Christians and the Muslims had captured, captured the Temple Mount many times over in terms. And uh, we don't like that period, like I told you, because of what the Crusaders did to the Jews, as well as the Muslims. It's the, one of the most embarrassing periods of our history. Anyways, Caliph Omar, uh, who is uh, from the Ottoman Empire, he uh, captured Jerusalem in 638 AD. This is six years after the death of Muhammad. Muhammad has died. Six years later, finally, take, uh, uh, the Ottomans take it away from the Benzemites. And in AD 692, after the death of Caliph of Omar, uh, the, the Dome of the Rock was built. You, you have to follow history. Then in 711 AD, Caliph Ab al wad another guy, he built the mosque. And Al al wad is this guy. He converted the St. Mary's Church, added the Dome of the Rock. He then called it al Aqsa. Very interesting, isn't it? So that it will be close to what was mentioned in the Quran, uh, the name. Now this is 80 years after the death of Muhammad. 80 years. And in this time, the mosque, uh, the sacred uh, mosque was, at that time, they always called the sacred mosque, Mecca, the furthest mosque, Medina. That was what was understood. But now they wanted the furthest mosque to be known as Al-Aqsa, instead of what was in Medina. So it became Islam's third most holiest site, as it is today. Now, God calls Jerusalem his holy city many, many times in the Bible. All over. He says, this is my holy city. And through the years, Jerusalem was fought over by the Muslims, by the Christians, until 1948, when Israel was formally recognized as a nation. And then the Arab waged war, as I told you, and, the Jer and, the, and Jerusalem was not, was eventually conquered by, by the British, and um, then it was kind of divided by Judea and Samaria, which is known as the West Bank today, is given to the Arabs. Now, the fleeing migrants who were there at that time because of the diaspora, there were many, many migrants who used to be somehow despised by the Arab nations at that time. There were people who were taking care, they were like the Bedouins. Bedouins are people who were, um, you know, taking care of sheep and so on. And so some of them didn't want them. They said, go, go, go to that land. Go, because there's nothing in Jerusalem anyway. There's no water. Go there and, and take care of those. Take, take your sheep, take your goats. And so there were a lot of these Arab migrants from all over that their old Arab brothers wouldn't accept. They were somehow exiled into this area. Anyway, during the time of the war, the, there were many people who fled uh, the, that entire area. And unfortunately, during this period, um, when the Jews were finally led back into the country without uh, getting all of Israel, just parts of it, these people who had occupied the land were leaving. And then, during that time was when Arafat uh, found uh, a party and he called them the Palestinian people. Now you've got to understand that there was no such nation at that time. It was just because they were in the area. Uh, it's like, for example, we are Scandinavians if you are living here. It's an area. So there's no such nation called Scandinavia. It's, it's an area. So that's just the way it is. But anyway, uh, Arafat uh, tried to fight for the fact that they were a nation from, from people, so it was a status that was never given to them until just recently, and uh, they, they wanted to have uh, their own rule. During the time when Yasser Arafat was uh, alive, uh, he wanted Jerusalem divided, and he said the site of the Temple Mount given to him and uh, the, to Palestine, and this was offered finally to him in Camp David by Barak. Not Barack Obama, but uh, former Israeli president. The funny thing is that even when he was offered, finally, 
after lots of negotiation, he refused. He refused it. And that was really interesting. Because in Arabic at that time when he was still alive, he said that he actually wants to destroy this nation. He said, first we will take care of the Saturday people and then the Sunday people. So that's why peace is so hard to find because they can't. Now, for the Jews to live anywhere else in the world will be to be Kaluts, it's, it's to be a refugee. Uh, and therefore, during the diaspora, they've been all over the place, they've come back, they felt, now we have come back to our land. How, how is it that they, they maintain their language and their culture and their religion? Because while they were being despised in the world, because of this anti-Semitic feeling uh, that was around the world, while they were anywhere in the world, they were usually forced into ghettos. So they always lived together and formed together. And because they were together, they preserved their language, they preserved their culture, they preserved their, preserved their religion, and they stayed together. And that was their saving factor. Kind of being persecuted by the rest, pulling together, they preserved it. And so finally when they came back to Israel, even though the Jewish language is one of the oldest in the world, they still kept it. And they still use it till today. And the uh, religion and so on. Yet, um, today, UN has a very, very special agreement with Jerusalem. That's because of what the people did to come back to the land. The funny thing is that before Israel came back to the land, it was basically like desert. As I told you, but after they finally came back to the land, you can actually have satellite images before and after, and it's insane to look at how among the desert there is this green, lush land. After they came back, because God said, When you come back, I'll bless you. They were all over the place, they were being because they came back, they were being blessed. And not only God blessed them, Israel, you know, it, it, till today they're actually producing fruit. You'll be surprised, they're producing fruit, oranges to around the world. Israel is selling. Um, tulips to Holland for crying out loud. And you're like, what? You know, it's, it's, it's insane. They sell technology. Because God said, I'll bless you. I'll bless you and you'll be a blessing to the world. And uh, the, the way that, that land is being blessed today, when the people came back, is insane. When you look at satellite images, you say, this cannot be true. And they've got formed, uh, some irrigation, some of the best technologies in the world and science and thank God. And, and in fact, during the, the World War uh, II, there was a Jewish man. They, they a lot, a lot, God bless them and kept them a lot of in, in interesting in, in, you know, invention. One of the guys is, is called Klein Weissman. Klein Weissman was actually invented um, smokeless gunpowder, which actually helped the Allied forces to win the war e eventually because of that. And when he did that, he was actually promised Jerusalem. He was said, since you did this, we promised you. But when they finally got Jerusalem, uh, the Winston Churchill was a little afraid of the Arab because they needed oil from there at that time. So he said, uh, I know I promise you this, but uh, we will divide it. So they literally, I'm not joking, they literally took the map of Jerusalem and drew a, like, you know, a quarter. Okay, this is the Aramaic quarters, the Jewish quarters, Christian quarters, Israel quarters. There you go, take it. That was how it was settled. It was, it was probably one of the most insane way of dividing the city. But anyway, so it is, they are there, and um, we still have the peace talks. But in the book of Daniel, as I close, I want to mention to you that the Bible says that uh, they will be talking about peace, 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 while war will still be at hand. Um, the Bible tells us that in the book of Thessalonians, Matthew, even in the book of Revelations, that the third temple will eventually be built, because there must, there will take place a massive war in the Middle East, and I believe it has to do with the Temple Mount, and eventually the third temple will be built, as we can see in the scriptures. And this will culminate to some of the biggest events where there's going to be a clash, I believe, between nations and forces that will surround uh, Russia and nations and forces that will surround US slash Europe. Some major clash will take place, and some, I believe, nuclear exchange will take place. Because according to the Bible, it says it's going to take seven months. Uh, for people to be buried. Usually when you have a nuclear explosion, uh, you don't enter into that zone at least for seven months because of the high risk of radiation. You gotta wait much later before you know. So it, takes, it says it takes seven months to bury the dead. It's not because of that many dead, it's because of the radioactivity in that area. And the Bible talks about this mystery uh, Babylonia that is this, you know, that's uh, disappeared in an hour and how the whole world who had traded with her uh, um, world will weep. It's, uh, I don't know of any other 
description as closest to it as uh, the stock exchange uh, in New York today that is basically being uh, revealed uh, with everyone. What we need to be aware is that uh, the Bible says such a thing will happen and then finally there will come an antichrist who will make an agreement with, with, with Israel and three and a half years later breaks it but um, Jesus himself will come to restore and, 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 and solve this period of uh, pain and war and injustice and so on. So what we need to also know is that the Bible tells us as believers to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's what we find in Psalm 122. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It sometimes can be very, very discouraging to pray for it because if you see all the destruction that's going on around you, it's almost insane. But uh, we should just pray for the peace of Jerusalem and be aware that what's going on in the Middle East today is not as simple as, uh, oh, this is the Palestinian. And, uh, and my heart moves every time I see the news. And, and of course, nobody wants innocent civilians to die and children to be caught between the crossfires. At the same time, nobody wants to live in a house or a land where you're constantly being bombarded uh, by somebody who is firing rockets at you. And if you try to make peace, he says, the only peace I want is that I want to destroy your entire nation and your entire life. You. And when you've been uh, exiled three times over uh, in your entire generation and lifetime, that's a uh, pill that's a little bit hard to swallow. Are you following? So it's, uh, and, and, and there's a big difference because you have got a political party who wants to make peace, and then you have extreme cases of, uh, of there have been extreme cases in every religion, mm -hmm. even in Christianity. We spoke about the Crusaders. Today we have got some extreme wings of Islam that is a little bit difficult for the world to deal with. They don't even know what to do with. We recently had this Boko Haram that goes out and kidnaps people in, in Nigeria. And now you have this uh, ISIS, which is uh, very, uh, then you are dealing with, um, for example, the same thing in, in Hamas, uh, which is basically a party that doesn't want to, to make the uh, Hezbollah. Then you have got the Islamic Jihad. Their goal is like, we just want to see this entire nation wiped out. How do you make peace? That's, that's, that's a big problem. So you, you got to have a political party that's willing to re recognize your existence. You make peace with a living person. You can't make peace with a person you already decided you're going to destroy. So therefore, it's very important to have a party that is willing to have the peace and then hopefully it will be there. But I just want you to know in the long run, the Bible makes it very clear that uh, it's going to be the coming of the Messiah eventually that will solve this conflict in the Middle East. But we need to know, as every time you look at the media, um, try to remember that there's a spiritual dimension to it. Because what we see is very politically um, uh, framed and unfortunately not necessarily spiritually framed. So we want to close in a word of prayer uh, with this little, I don't know if I can call it a preaching, maybe teaching, maybe history lesson. And uh, we will end, uh, give you some time for questions and answers, maybe a few of it, then we'll end. Is that okay? Did you get anything out of it or was it just a waste of your time? <laughs> waste of your time. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh,